wanted to go to Mungo for quite some time, like years. And I finally went for two nights and three days with a great group of friends for photography and I pretty much fudged the whole trip and now I'm gonna have to go back again. It took five years of thinking about visiting Mungo before I finally made the jump to make it happen. I messaged a couple of friends, we set a date, and before we knew it, we were on our way out west. After stopping in Bal Ranald for supplies in the afternoon, we headed for Homebush Hotel, a classic Aussie outback pub, about 25 kilometres out of Bal Ranald, which offered free camping and showers right next to the pub. The camping area turned out to be a bare patch of dirt littered with three corner jacks probably the nastiest, prickliest burrs your feet could ever experience. I delicately picked my way to the bar in thongs, attracting a few laughs from the patrons as I pulled the thorns out. Prickly jacks aside, we were met with a warm welcome and enjoyed our drinks and hearty pub meals. Next morning, with under two hours drive to go, we were keen to get to Mungo and hit the road. We cruised the bitumen, then onto the red dirt, spying the occasional kangaroo and emu roaming the plains. It's a pretty easy drive in dry conditions. Technically, Mungo is a lake basin, which dried up around 16,000 years ago, and over many, many years, erosion from wind and water has created the ridged formations that make it a popular photography and camping spot. The discovery of Mungo Lady in 1968 and subsequently Mungo Man in 74 made Mungo one of the world's most famous archaeological sites. I always assumed Mungo was some kind of indigenous name, but it's actually named after the sheep station that the National Park was once a part of, which in turn is named after the Scottish Saint Mungo, no doubt reflecting the heritage of the original station owners. So don't be surprised if the park and Mr. and Mrs. Mungo are given a renaming ceremony in the near future. Arriving at Mungo HQ, it was a bit disappointing to find how far away the campground was from anything interesting. Apart from a one kilometre loop walk through the scrub with a handful of birds, you had to drive several k's to find anything worth photographing. Because I looked into visiting Mungo years ago, I didn't do much research on the area beforehand, thinking I knew what to expect. But times have changed. When we arrived, I realised you weren't permitted to walk anywhere near the formations, except on the fairly limited viewing platforms or by hiring a guide. The campground was pretty busy. You definitely need to book ahead. One thing I wasn't prepared for was the total fire ban. They didn't mention it on the website, which stated fires were permitted, but only in the supplied fire pits with your own firewood, which is pretty standard. Next time I will definitely wait until after the 1st of April, as nighttime wasn't too exciting, getting teased in the cold by a nice looking fireplace with a barbecue plate and three bags of firewood, which I brought along for nothing. We did join a tour for sunset and paid $50 each for the guide to escort us up closer to the walls of China formations, and it gave us the chance to get some shots from much better positions. Although we missed most of the talking part of the tour fiddling with our cameras, it was still pretty good, and the guide was very accommodating, pointing us to where we could and couldn't go. Next time, if funds permit, I would definitely hire a private guide, as we did have a dozen or so other tour participants wandering into our shots, which did make finding a good composition that bit more difficult. That said, the moonrise and sunset were spectacular, even with no cloud. The sparse landscape glowed beautifully, and we happily snapped away until the light faded and the guide ushered us back down the hill. morning we were up crunching gravel well before dawn and headed to Red Top's viewing platform for sunrise, accompanied by a very bright moon. After grabbing a few landscape shots, as soon as the light was sufficient, I headed down the road on foot looking for birds. 
Not a bad run. I saw some zebra finches, a red cap robin, a very brief sighting of a hooded robin, a family of white winged fairy wrens, singing honey eaters, a really beautiful red kangaroo, and a lovely surprise with a small flock of Major Mitchells gliding past. The chill in the air quickly gave way to heat and a cloudless sky. And as we were all starving and dying for a coffee, we headed the eight kilometres or so back to camp. And now came my next major mistake. I let indecision get the better of me and because nobody else was interested in doing the 70 kilometre self-drive tour, I decided to stay in the campground and just go for a walk and look for birds. A decision I came to regret. There were very few birds in the campground area and I returned home empty-handed. I pretty much wasted that whole day, save for a visit from a chatty group of apostle birds in the afternoon. Realising my mistake at not doing the self-drive tour, on the day of checkout, my friend and I drove off early to start the tour before sunrise. It was extremely cold and the light was way too low for any bird shots. We drove past the Bela camp, but didn't stop. We also did a 500 metre melee walk, which looked like a good birding spot, but it was still a bit too early. If I go back again, I'd definitely be making a beeline for Bella for birding. Something I didn't expect was the amount of feral animals. Herds of goats obviously hadn't read the signs and wandered unrestricted through the rock formations. We also sighted several feral cats. One was particularly large, which is always a bit concerning when you're looking for birds. Stopping to make a car park coffee at the Vigors Wells picnic area, I made mistake number three. I stupidly left the car doors open before wandering up towards the dunes. I was just about to get to the interesting bit when another vehicle pulled up alongside my van in the distance. Seeing we had a lot of equipment on board, I made the decision not to risk it and headed back down to lock the vehicle while my friend ventured into the dunes, which meant I didn't have the time to walk back up there again. The saving grace was a last minute visit by a couple of Major Mitchells, one with a juvenile, so at least I got a couple of shots, but the whole drive tour was marred by annoyance at myself for bad planning. Well, we made it back to camp just in time to pack up our gear and leave for checkout. And I left with a bit of a sinking feeling that I really didn't make the most of my time at Mungo and I had no one to blame but myself. I know it's not a big deal, I was on holidays anyway and there's nothing wrong with the day of relaxing, but it does take a lot to get away on these trips. I have to organise house sitters and bird minders for my three parrots and then there's the cost and expense of getting there in the first place. It's over a 12 hour drive to Mungo, so it's not something I can just do at the drop of a hat. Oh well, better luck next time. One thing we did do was stop at an area I spied on the way into Mungo, about 20 kilometres out of Bell Reynolds, not far past the Homebush Hotel. I was drawn in by a bridge signposted with Paker Creek and what looked like a nice little billabong, flush with water and lots of birds chirping away in the trees. I couldn't resist stopping for a quick scout around for next time. The billabong turned out to be gorgeous, with definite kayaking possibilities and quite the oasis for local birds. In the 15 minutes or so we were there, I heard many different species and it's definitely a place I'll be saving some time for on my next visit. Let me know in the comments if you've explored that area, I'd be keen to know more. So that was my bittersweet Mungo experience and now for the exciting nugget of Mungo gossip. Now, I can't reveal my source, but it was from a longtime local who told me that when Mungo Man was found, another 50 skeletons were found and they had different shaped heads. Now, these skeletons were whipped away, never to be seen of again, and the site where all of this was found was blocked off to the public and marked with only a small survey peg, which was later removed. Interesting, huh? My upcoming videos are about Yanga National Park near Bol Reynold and Green Lake Recreation Reserve near Sea Lake and Lake Tyrrell, a place I absolutely loved, so I hope you can tune in for those ones. I'm super excited about my upcoming trip to Bali and Lombok. It's just under a fortnight away and has been a long time in the planning. I look forward to taking you there with me. Catch you soon.